It's great to be here today. And as David said, um, my name's Gordon Wakeford, and my day job is actually running the Siemens Mobility Company here in the UK. We've got that stand just over there. And if you see people with these ties on, they're Siemens. That's the only sales bit for today. But it is a transportation business that employs 4,400 people here in the UK. But I'm speaking to you today, today, and I have the honour of speaking to you today as chairman of the Rail Supply Group, which is an organisation that represents all of us in the rail supply chain. And it's a real pleasure to have been invited to give this speech for the Mid Midlands Engine in the Knowledge Hub. So let's start with some good news. You've probably seen this before, but let's start with some good news. We have a lot to celebrate today in today's railway. These are the published figures you can see here. I think they're understated. But if you just look at this slide, 124,000 people employed in our industry, turning over some £7 billion per annum and adding value of £3.8 billion. That's something that we should really be proud of as UK Rail. And I think that's understated. It's been said, you know, since privatisation, which is 20 years ago now, 20 years ago, that only the best companies have survived. So you're you are all pretty good. We are all pretty good at what we do. Also, the published pipeline for spend in the UK rail industry is still £88 billion. That's obviously high speed two, the remainder of control period five, and ongoing investment in transport for London. But that's an awful lot of money. We know, of course, that passenger numbers have are the largest since the war, have doubled in the last 20 years, and indeed will double again. So there's a lot to go at. We, in the supply chain, are actually pretty robust, pretty busy at the moment, given that level of investment. But you know, not many of us, not many of us perhaps exhibiting today, are exporting, and that's something we have to look at. And also, finally, on the good news front, in 2016, may have been just a little bit late, but the rail sector was, was the 12th sector to publish its actual strategy to government. So we have some really great opportunities, but also, as always, we're in times of change. These four headings I've got on the slide here can be taken perhaps in any order, but of course, working for a technology company, I'm going to take technology first. Everybody is talking about the digital railway. In fact, a colleague of mine is my opposite number is on the stage just down there talking about Digital Railway as we speak. But Digital Railway, what is that? Trains that will control themselves, using data in an intelligent way to monitor all the assets as well as the trains. Instrument the network, so remote, remotely monitoring the track quality and wear, the overhead line equipment quality and wear, predictive and preventative train maintenance, measuring the quality of the complete asset, including the civils. And to quote Mark Kahn, he said, it cannot be that we use a train, use a train to detect a landslide. And he's referring to an incident last September, just outside Watford Junction by the tunnel, as a landslide, and it's one of our trains, a Siemens train, class 350, hit the landslide, derailed. Nobody was hurt, but that was the first we knew of that landslide. And how can that, how can that be right? in the technology world we live in today. Digitalization will involve big data and the sensible use of data. Data acquisition, data mining, data analysis, and intelligent action will all be part of the future railway. But remember, of course, that data equals knowledge. And who owns that data? Of course, it crosses that track train divide. There is, of course, an opportunity, if you build a new railway, to do all this stuff from scratch. So High Speed 2, we're looking at that. How can that be developed to have all this opportunity built into it from day one? On this slide here, and I've said this before, you can see that I've got autonomous vehicles. And one has to ask oneself, will we have driverless cars, perhaps, before we have driverless trains? An interesting thought. Moving on to social, now a lot of this will actually depend on the technology. Rail customers will no longer wait at a station concourse to see which platform their train's coming into. Sometimes you can get that today, but they want it explicitly, already informed on their smartphones via the new seamless ticketing system. In this day and age, 
information is everything. And what about our workforce? We're just looking at myself. We're all just getting that little bit older. And do you know the Rail Delivery Group and the National Skills Academy for Rail are predicting that in the next 10 years, we as a rail industry have to recruit 100,000, yes, 100,000 new employees into our industry. I used to say 50,000, but I've been corrected, it's double that, it's 100,000. A lot of those, and 50% of those, were looking at to be apprentices and graduates, and 20% of those individuals being women. This is a real opportunity, but also a major challenge. The other industrial sectors will want the very same people. How do we ensure in the rail industry that we create the right jobs that attract our young people to join us? So training schemes and accredited qualifications and university courses that are tailored to our needs. But above all, perhaps, those individuals who want certainty of a future. It always comes down in the end, you know, to certainty. That brings you on to political. Well, what about Brexit and the forthcoming election? I think as far as Brexit is concerned, we're starting to see what the problems could be in the rail industry, if not yet the solutions. Free movement of labour will be an issue. Most technology development and indeed manufacture is pan border these days, including supply parts, which some of you may produce, that cross borders many times as they get built into systems and trains. So some of your parts may be on that European journey. We're told that standards will be enshrined in, within British law from day one. Well, that's OK. We're being enshrined en masse as we start. That's OK for the current state. But how will we influence those standards, those European standards, if we're not part of the club in the future? On here, I mentioned productivity. And politicians and industry always talk about productivity. But what does this really mean? Simply put, it's more for less, which is cost productivity. Or we invent something really high tech, which is unique and sent over and over again, which is technology productivity. But also a higher skilled workforce using new technology will always be more efficient. Also increased volume and continuity of supply will bring productivity in itself. At a government level, we need growth in the economy and increased gross value add. This is industrial output. And the key for the railway is, as part of UK PLC, we must keep up the investment, start the process. We must use new technology. And in a Brexit world, we must train UK citizens to perform these tasks. So what about local sourcing? This is a big issue for our Brexit government. What I will say is that the investment is so large, about £88 billion, that there's room for everybody. And if we need world-leading technology, we need to look across the world. But regardless of Brexit, it is up to us, the UK supply base, to stand up, be counted, be good, and obtain a key share of this investment. It is ours to lose. Economic. I think I've covered a lot of this already. A key message to government is, though, please continue with the investment profile and ensure continuity, especially between CP5 and CP6. That's a real and current danger we're facing at the moment as an industry. In the centre there, what are the implications of these four factors? Well, I think I've covered a lot of them, but number one for me is reputation. We as an industry are actually terrible about singing our own praises. Just think of those Christmas and bank holiday working processes and handbacks, which actually are world class. But we adopt the no news is good news approach. We all know in the UK when we're late by a day or half a day, but we never celebrate what has actually been achieved in a short time frame, sometimes in really atrocious conditions. Today we have one of the world's safest railways, of course the oldest railway, and one of the business, busiest railways and it runs better today than ever before. So moving on from reputation, what is the rail supply group actually doing to move us forward? While you read that slide, perhaps I give you some background, but we do have a plan. Our aims are shown here. 
But just to let you know, the Rail Supply Group was formed a few years ago together with government, and that's the key thing. It's, it's, I'm the industrial chair, but I work closely with Bayes and the Department for Transport who are closely involved with the Rail Supply Group. And the vision is, and I'll read it out, by working closely with the Rail Delivery Group, set the direction for the industry by providing leadership and guidance to other industrial bodies, trade associations and government to lead a programme of work on behalf of the UK rail supply chain. So that's on behalf of you. The word leadership may appear rather grand, but this is actually what we do. I hear you say, Gordon, this all sounds very good, but what actually have you done? Well, we have four work streams, all headed by industrial leaders like myself, and let me just quickly take you for, through those four work streams. The first one, creating market conditions for growth, it not only addresses the issue of ensuring this continuity of supply, but also understanding really how the procurement tra train is organised and try to ensure that somehow it can be joined up. By that I mean have a true industrial strategy, and we'll be talking about that later on today, but have a true industrial strategy which is developed where behaviours will need to change. Government, clients and also us as suppliers. Some new ideas are already coming out of the uh, digital rail team with the Network Rail, and if you look at that uh, brochure that was that's published a few months ago, the Early Contractor Involvement Report, which is shown here, you can see we as an industry have questioned the status quo on procurement and demonstrate the productivity that can be gained by join for joining forces whilst maintaining a competitive market. Accelerating the uptake of innovation, we've launched the Rail Technical Strategy Capability Plan, which identifies and prioritises the technology where the UK can be world class. We've also jointly submitted an industrial academic bid for £90 million network of technology, which is called Centres of Excellence. This is the UK Rail Research and Innovation Network. It involves some eight universities, including a number of local universities here, so the Birmingham Centre for Rail Research and Education, Loughborough University and Nottingham University. People and Skills. We've developed and published together with the Railway Delivery Group, the National Skills Academy for Rail, and the Rail, we've actually um, published the Rail Skills Delivery Plan. This aims to ensure that we have an industry with, coherence, with a coherent skills plan which attracts the best talent, as I said earlier. And we, aim, we have the strap phrase, really. We have the aim to have the right people in the right place with the right skills at the right time over that 10-year programme. So that's quite a big ask, but it would be good if we could do that. So far as exports is concerned, a tremendous amount of effort has been made to establish what are the top-level tangible actions that can be taken by industry and government which will aid this strategy, rather than just relying on market forces. It's obvious that we need a strong home market to act as a benchmark for any export. So High Speed 2, Crossrail, Network Rail and Transport for London must act as showcases so we can see what, and demonstrate what we can do here in the UK. We need to raise our profile, show what we're good at and explore new, works, new routes to market. Also the Rail Minister, and he's still the Rail Minister today, Paul Maynard, has actively supported the UK PLC abroad by being actively seen and attending Inner Trans and Middle East Rail. So what happens next? As most of you will know, recently the government launched its Industrial Strategy Green Paper with the 10 Pillars of Challenge and this consultation finished mid-April, 17th of April, and the Rail Supply Group and its stakeholders, of course including the Railway Industrial Association, encouraged by you, the suppliers, and the supply chain, we all got involved to give a response back to government. So let's have a look at what that could look like. What we said as an industry, that perhaps we could promise some of the things you can see here on this screen. So we'd increase our productivity. We'd work out how to increase our productivity across the rail supply chain. We'd consider whole life costing rather than perhaps spot buying. 
We're certainly going to recruit that high level of uh, employees into our organisations and train them over the next 10 years. That will give us higher skilled labour. We're also going to adopt new technology and bring that into the rail industry. This is all grand stuff, but if we as an industry are going to do that, what support would we actually expect from government? What could we ask for? Top of the list, and we hear it from all of you, all of our suppliers, and Siemens included, is actually we would want to demand pipeline visibility and stability. That's productivity, as I said before, in itself. We could get paid for output rather than input, so pay for output. And we'd need help in strengthening the UK supply base and funding to, to help upskill our workforce and recruit that vast number of employees into the rail industry. There's awful, an awful lot to do. What does this mean and what's the role for the Midlands engine? Obviously that's what we're here to talk about today. Bayes and the Department for International Trade take the Britain first approach. But the RSG recognises that the Midlands engine and indeed the Northern Powerhouse offer vast capability across the region. Being here at the NEC, in the, obviously in, in Birmingham, at the heart of the powerhouse, it's great to be able to underline the area's capabilities and offerings, so I'll do that quite quickly. Britain's rail is undergoing its own industrial revolution. In fact, across infrastructure, overhead line equipment and rolling stock, the Midlands engine gives perfect examples of the RSG's four pillars. Firstly, on innovation, with aerospace and automotive companies obviously as neighbours and collaborators, the region is ripe for nurturing and demonstrating cross-sector technology. Skills Gap, the National Training Academy for Rail, the Birmingham Centre for Rail Research and Education and the National Skills Academy for Rail are all local. These are great examples of the rich vocational and academic strides being made in the zone for the benefit of the entire sector. Conditions for growth? Well, high speed two, I've got to mention it again. It's an easy but unignorable reference and it's self-proclaimed strapline as a catalyst for growth, taking the catalyst of growth out of Canary Wharf and into Snow Hill here in Birmingham with that interconnectivity. So that's going to be great for the Northern Powerhouse. And international trade. Just refer to the brochure here, which is the Midlands Engine brochure. The region is an incubator for foreign direct investment, but also home to no end of proactive companies trading on the global rail stage. So as I've already said, are a large transportation business here in the UK, with major premises and offices across this region, including, of course, our Northampton depot. We, as Siemens, are key stakeholders in the Midlands engine. As you can see from today and my presentation today, I'm also proud to be chair of the Railway Supply Group. But this gives me unprecedented, unprecedented and tremendous exposure across our industry. And do you know what? I'm always astonished by how good we really are, how good you are. We can be proud of what we achieve in the British rail industry today. Change is always inevitable, and I've alluded to some of the change this morning, or this afternoon it is now, but we will embrace this change. We will develop a railway for the 21st century and deliver a railway that we can be proud of and our grandchildren can ride upon. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, you, I think you gave a very positive uh, view of what the rail supply chain is already doing, but also its potential for the future uh, through developing that dialogue uh, with government and with the, the industry. I'm sure there's lots of questions in the audience, and Chris has a microphone. Um, if, you've a, if you'd like to ask a question, please could you just introduce yourself and then give us your question. So who, who wants to be first? Don't all shout at once. First one's also worst. Yeah. Here we go. Hi, Max Pardo from KMT. 
Uh, you talked about the uh, Midlands engine and one of the key plans for it is to uh, increase productivity. Um, why would, why, would they, why would that not have already happened? What are the barriers to that currently happening? And how are you actually going to be able to make sure that, that businesses within the Midlands are able to increase the productivity? Because surely that's something that we've been talking about for a hell of a long time, and it's in businesses' own interest to do it. So why haven't they? Yeah. I, think, I think, to be frank, the, the, as I said in the, my first slide, the UK supply industry is pretty robust already. Because if you're not a good company, you haven't survived the turmoil of the last 20 years, to be frank. But government talk about productivity, and they're talking about industrial output. And the message back is, yeah, we, we can tinker with our, our internal efficiency, and I think that might be where you're coming from. But I think we're already pretty good at that. We can always do better. We can always do better. I've got factories here in the UK, Siemens factories in the UK, and they're benchmarked directly with the German factories. We're on par. There's no, there's, you know, we're, we're there. We're there. It's about the more strategic productivity angle. And what can we do as a country, and that's where my hat, where my hat to the rail supply group, what can we do to raise our game? And that actually is about volume, it's about local value add, it's about ensuring continuity of supply and not feast of famine, and then you can plan for the future, invest in new tooling, train your staff, up, upskill your existing workforce, but no company's going to do that, big or small, unless you can see a future and a rosy future. The thing is, there is a rosy future, but at the moment, there's this little bit of an impasse with CP5 and CP6, this crossover period. And we've got to sort that out. But the question was actually, why haven't we done it already? I think we have done it in the companies. As a nation, we just need to get together. That's the role of the rail supply group with government to say, how can we make things even better and, and more achievable for our companies? Okay. An another question for Gordon, who would like to pick, it, pick up next? Okay. Excellent. Oh, hi, Gordon. David Wokes from Jonathan Lee Group. Um, it's all about skills for, for where we're involved with the 100,000 uh, people issue. Um, how re We've got the colleges, we've got a lot of development going on. Um, engineering has to play the, uh, the major part in us achieving that. How are we going to really compete against other industries that are already having the same sort of skill shortages? How do we make that difference? I, th I think um, there's two challenges, to be frank. One is um, you know, all the emotion around immigration. Certainly as Siemens today, we couldn't deliver some of our major infrastructure projects here in the UK without our EU workers. That's not your question, but that's a, a fact. We, we import those skills today. Going forward, that's an opportunity for UK PLC, that we need more of those people. We're going to have to breed, breed them and educate them internally, as it were, in the future, which is a great opportunity, but you're right. We'll be competing with the aerospace industry, with the automotive industry, with all other engineering industries that we're good at in the UK. So we've got to differentiate ourselves in the, in the rail industry to attract those individuals in. I haven't got the answer for it, although we have a, 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 a national advert campaign that runs on rail. We're trying to up our game, trying to make this a sexy industry, a digital industry. We're not trying to, it's going to become a digital industry. And that's the sort of um, environment that these young engineers, I hope, are going to work, want to work for. And we've really got to up our aim with the ladies. I mean, I said 20%, and people said, why are you 20% gone? Why isn't it 50% of, of the new mm -hmm. employees? Well, yeah, I'd love that to be the case. We're coming from such a low ebb, I think it's between 6 and, and 11, depends who you speak to. That um, you know, 20 cents. You've got to have a vision that people believe in. If it could be 50 percent, that's great. So we've really got to look at women as well coming into our industry. Okay, question here, Chris. Hello, uh, Sean Long from Enterprise Ireland, Irish Hi, government. Sean. Just a quick question. I understand that the rail industry is working with SC21 on competitor and growth. Uh, aero, aviation and rail, is that correct? Uh, to form a new standard? I, I'm not actually aware of that. So do you, do you want me to pick that, that up? That, David, yeah? um, we're not yet. Uh, one of the things that we've identified as the industry develops is we need to at least think about uh, supplier development programmes. So we've been looking at programmes that other industries have operated, and you've quoted uh, two examples, SC21 and supply sh uh, sharing and growth, both of which are from the aerospace industry. So we're studying them to make an informed decision about what we might want to do as an industry. There is, of course, the, the challenge then of funding, and what the other sectors have been very successful at is building on their equivalent of, the, of our document, the um, 
um, our rail industrial strategy, Fast Track to the Future, they've built on their equivalent to have a grown-up conversation with, with government about the support that they need. And that's, that's, we're at the foothills of that, uh, of that discussion at the moment. Glad you're here. Uh, hi, Gordon. I'm, I'm Bill Free from Carillion. I just uh, one of the points you raised earlier was the, the the usefulness, the importance of an outpace output based specifications for for railway type work. Where would you see the sort of best practice in that is at the moment within within you know, this country or the world? You know, or, you know, it's a very good question. I don't know if it exists elsewhere. I really don't. From the point of you know, so it, people around the world, when it's talking the rail industry, still tend to buy traditionally. And I think there's something we can do as a UK, as, U, as UK PLC, is have something different again, because it involves finance. And we're good at finance in this country, and we just need to somehow connect with rail. We all know how cash-strapped they are, and the government is as well. Are there alternative methods of financing these projects, as well as you know, bundling up the franchises, perhaps, different, in a different way in the future? So you're not just buying the train, you're buying a network upgrade, a track upgrade at the same time, digitalization. Easy stuff to say, but you've got to have an industrial strategy that actually sets that up, sets that about. And that's what we're starting to engage on. And that doesn't mean, as I heard Paul Plummer saying earlier, you know, it doesn't mean that one company does all that. You still have you know, people com competing for different parts of it, but actually there's a different way of actually going to market. And we're just thinking how that could happen.